Beneath the veneer of skepticism, reality bears witness to chilling truths in the haunting corridors of history where shadows dance with undeniable evidence. Remember this, the stories are true. Prepare for a revelation where the supernatural is stripped of fiction and the unknown is laid bare. Are you ready to confront the undeniable? The stories are true and the echoes of reality await. All right. Buckle up, because I'm about to take you on a journey through the twisted halls of Carbrook Hall, where the ghosts are as lively as the caffeine addicts waiting in line at Starbucks. Picture this. You walk through the creaky old door, and suddenly you're transported back in time, back to the days when this place was more pub than coffee joint. The atmosphere hits you like a ghostly chill as you take in the ancient oak walls, feeling like you've stumbled into the set of a horror movie. But hey, don't worry, we're just here for the spooky fun, right, right? Now let's talk about the regulars. And I don't mean the living kind. There's this one spectral fella, an old timer who's been haunting the bar since before Starbucks even dreamed of taking over. Legend has it, he's sitting there, pint in hand, looking like death warmed over, but having a grand old time nonetheless. You try to strike up a conversation, thinking maybe he'll share a ghostly tale or two, but before you can say boo, he vanishes into thin air faster than you can say, double shot espresso. But wait, it gets even creepier. Some brave souls claim to have heard the faint sound of children's laughter echoing through the halls in the dead of night. Yeah, nothing like the giggles of ghostly kiddos to keep you on your toes. And those footsteps? They're not just your average creaks and groans of an old building settling in for the night. No, they're like death's own drum roll, announcing the arrival of who knows what lurking in the shadows. So, if you're feeling adventurous and in need of a caffeine fix, why not swing by Carbrook Hall? Grab yourself a coffee and see if you can spot any death-like drinkers or spectral kiddos. Just don't say I didn't warn you if things start to get a little too spooky for comfort. Welcome to Carbrook Hall, where even the ghosts need their morning pick-me-up, and the only thing scarier than the spirits is the price of a venti latte. tight for the next one. So picture this out in a field near Heath, about 1.5 miles east of Wakefield city centre stands Dame Mary Ball's water tower. Now this ain't your ordinary water tower. It's got history, it's got spookiness and it's listed as grade 2 which I reckon is like getting a participation trophy but for buildings. Back in the 17th century, when fancy water towers were all the rage, this five-stage beauty was built next to Heath Old Hall. Legend has it that it was powered by a natural spring and a water wheel, serving up fresh water to the hall like it was going out of style. Now, the dame herself, Mary with them turned balls, had a life story that could rival any soap opera. Her dad bit the dust when she was just a teen, and then some poor woman named Mary Panel got the short end of the stick when folks accused her of witchcraft and after talk about an ornery start to life. But Dame Mary wasn't one to let life's curvy balls knock her down. No, she married into wealth, snagged herself a fancy title from King Charles I, Skinner a Baroness when that wasn't even a thing in England, and apparently had a side gig in witchcraft. Can you imagine? One minute you're brewing potions, the next you're getting knighted by the king. Now, when Dame Mary passed on in 1662, she left behind a bit of a mystery. Her will demanded that the room where she kicked the bucket be sealed up tight, and they actually did it. For 50 whole years, that room sat there like a time capsule. But when they finally cracked it open, folks started seeing things like Dame Mary's ghost roaming the heath, probably wondering why they didn't just leave her room alone in the first place. Fast forward to today and you've got ghost hunters flocking to the water tower like it's Black Friday at the haunted house store. The locals are either brave souls or just plain crazy, venturing inside to see if they can catch a glimpse of Dame Mary's spirit doing a little spectral salsa. But here's the kicker, they've even got a bedroom door on display at the Wakefield Museum. Imagine being so famous for your ghostly antics that they stick your door in a museum. Talk about making an entrance. Sure, the tower might be a bit worse for wear, with nettles and brambles doing their best to reclaim it, but it's still standing strong. And who knows, maybe Dame Mary's up there somewhere, brewing potions and plotting her next ghostly appearance. But hey, if you ever find yourself near Heath, and you're feeling brave, why not pay her a visit? Just don't forget your ghost repellent, and a healthy dose of skepticism. You never know what kind of honorary spirits you might encounter. Hold tight for the next one.
All right, buckle up because I'm about to spill the beans on the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. And let me tell you, it's not just any old hotel. It's like a Hollywood time capsule with a dash of spookiness and a sprinkle of glam. Legend has it that the ghost of Marilyn Monroe still roams around her old stomping grounds there. And get this, there was this famous mirror in the lobby where folks would snap pictures, claiming they could see Marilyn's reflection hovering above them. Classic Hollywood drama, right? But guess what, they removed that mirror from the lobby, I mean, talk about killjoys, am I right? Now, on to the ninth floor, where you can supposedly hear the ghostly tunes of the late actor Montgomery Clift practicing on his trumpet. I mean, imagine being a guest and calling the front desk to complain about the noise, only to find out the room next door is vacant, it's like a ghost orchestra up in there. And that's not all. The lights flicker, the faucets turn on and off on their own, and the switchboard gets calls from empty rooms. I tell ya, it's enough to make even the most sanguine guest a bit jittery. But wait, there's more. Flashback to 1929, when the very first Academy Award ceremony was held right there in the Roosevelt. Can you believe it? It wasn't like the glitzy affairs we see today, oh no. This was a private gala dinner followed by a quick 15-minute presentation. I mean, they didn't even broadcast it on TV or radio. Talk about old-school Hollywood charm. And let's not forget the hotel's guest list. It's like a who's who of classic Hollywood. Marilyn Monroe, Charlie Chaplin, Clark Gable, you name it. They've probably graced the halls of the Roosevelt. It's like stepping back in time to the golden era, right in the heart of Los Angeles. So, if you're ever in town and feeling brave, why not check in and see if you can catch a glimpse of Marilyn's ghost, or hear Montgomery Cliff's phantom trumpet serenade? Just don't blame me if you end up sleeping with the lights on. The nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning. Hold tight for the next one. All right, gather around, folks. And let me tell you a tale as twisted as a pretzel at a yoga retreat. Back in the golden days of Hollywood, when it was still Hollywoodland, that famous sign wasn't just a beacon for dreams and celluloid fantasies. Oh no. It was also a magnet for some phantasmal shenanigans. Picture this, a Broadway starlet named Peg Entwistle with more drama in her life than a soap opera marathon. Now, Peg, bless her heart, had a knack for attracting trouble like a magnet attracts metal shavings. Raised by her thespian dad, she had a childhood that would make Dickens shed a tear, losing not one, but two moms early on, and dealing with more broken relationships than a clumsy pottery maker. But wait, there's more. Despite her talents as an actress, Peg found herself stuck in the role of comedic sidekick, forever typecast as the ingenue who couldn't catch a break bigger than a fortune cookie at a diet convention. Sure, she shared the stage with the legendary Humphrey Bogart, but her film roles were smaller than a chihuahua in a Great Dane's world. Fast forward to September 18, 1932, and we've got ourselves a real Hollywood whodunit. A hiker stumbles upon Peg's crumpled body in a ravine below the sign. Police put two and two together, or should I say H and fall, surmising she climbed a workman's ladder and took a leap that would make evil Neville sweat. But here's where the story takes a ghostly turn. Visitors to the area swear they still catch a glimpse of Peg, haunting the sign like a VIP at an afterlife party. And if that's not enough to send chills down your spine, some claim to pick up the scent of her gardenia perfume, as if she's still making her presence known from beyond the grave. Talk about a Hollywood ending, am I right? Hold tight for the next one. Gather around, my fellow thrill-seekers, for I have a tale that'll twist your funny bone into knots and send shivers down your spine faster than you can say cantankerous. Picture this. Before the sunset strip transformed into the laughter-filled haven we know today, there stood Ciro's Restaurant, a glamorous hotspot that defined Hollywood's golden era in the swinging 40s and 50s. But hold on to your fedoras, because behind the glitz and glam lurked a dark secret. This joint, had ties to the mob that ran deeper than a secret handshake in a speakeasy. Yep, you heard me right. The owners of Ciro's were rubbing shoulders with the mafia, and the building itself was a veritable fortress of secrets, complete with peepholes in the walls that could make any private eye green with envy. Those peepholes weren't just for show, my friends. They were the mafia's eyes and ears, keeping tabs on every Tom, Dick, and Harry who dared step foot inside. 
And speaking of daring, enter Mickey, the king of the Sunset Strip, Cohen, strutting around like he owned the joint, because, well, he kinda did. But let me tell you, West Hollywood in those days wasn't all red carpets and movie stars. It was more like a scene straight out of a gangster flick, with gunfights erupting in the streets and drama simmering beneath the surface. Now hold on to your hats because here's where it gets juicy. Deep within the bowels of Ciro's lay a secret so dark, so sinister, it'd make Al Capone himself think twice. Legend has it that the basement was the mob's personal playground, a place where they'd whisk away their, shall we say, and let's just say they didn't play patty cake down there. There's even a staircase with a hole perfectly sized for a gun. Talk about a smoking gun, am I right? But wait, it gets even spookier. Employees of the comedy store, as it's known today, swear they've heard things that'll make your hair stand on end, echoing from the depths of that basement. We're talking voices in the dead of night, cries that send chills down your spine. And yes, even that'll make you question whether you're in a comedy club or a horror movie. After years of brushing off these ghostly tales like yesterday's leftovers, the comedy store finally decided to embrace its haunted history, offering tours of the basement that'll make even the bravest souls quiver in their boots. Who knew laughs and chills could go hand in hand? So if you're ever strolling down Sunset Strip and feeling brave, or maybe just a little foolish, why not take a trip down memory lane? Just watch out for any cantankerous spirits lurking in the shadows, eager to add a little boo to your ha-ha. Hold tight for the next one. Ah, gather round ye who seek a spine-tingling tale. Have you ever heard the woeful legend of Doña Petronilla? It's a yarn spun by the illustrious scribe Michael Imlay and the fine folks over at Creepy L.A., a tale so hauntingly delightful it warrants retelling each season. Picture this. In the waning years of the 1800s, the affluent Don Antonio Feliz met his untimely demise courtesy of the dreaded smallpox. But the plot thickens. His dear niece, the fair Dona, a mere 17 springs old, found herself swindled out of her uncle's fortune by conniving kin. In her anguish, she unleashed a hex upon the land and its heirs, a curse that would echo through the ages. Since that fateful day, misfortune has trailed the land's proprietors like a faithful hound. Even the infamous Griffith J. Griffith, its final proprietor, found himself embroiled in calamity. Not only did he bequeath a staggering 3,105 acres to the city, but he also found himself in the most scandalous of predicaments, behind bars for an unfortunate incident involving his firearm and his dearly wedded wife. Now, brace yourselves for the eerie part. Those who swear by the tale claim to have glimpsed the specter of young Donna herself, clad in a gown as white as moonlight, galloping through the misty trails astride a spectral steed. Ah, but the whispers of the park rangers, cries Thomas Davy, our intrepid security officer of Griffith Park. They speak of apparitions and otherworldly occurrences. Yet in all my years, four and a half to be exact, I've yet to lay eyes on a ghostly wisp myself. Oh, the mysteries that enshroud us, like cobwebs in the attic of time. But beware, dear listener, should you wander those haunted trails of Griffith Park, lest you find yourself face to face with the ghostly visage of Donna Petronilla herself and her ancient curse come to life. Hold tight for the next one. So, imagine this. Back in 1598, Sir Henry Griffith decides he wants to build himself a fancy Elizabethan manor house. He's probably thinking, oh, it'll be grand. People will come from far and wide just to marvel at its splendor. And thus, Burton Agnes Hall is born, complete with its lavish architecture and stunning gardens. Enter Anne, Sir Henry's unfortunate daughter. Now Anne had a bit of a rough go of it. In 1620, she was just minding her own business, probably frolicking through the gardens or planning her next grand soiree, when tragedy struck. She was attacked and killed, leaving behind a grieving family and a whole lot of unfinished business. But here's where things take a turn for the spooky. Before Anne shuffled off this mortal coil, she made a rather peculiar request. She told her family that she could never truly rest unless a part of her remained in her beloved home. Sounds innocent enough, right? Well, here's the kicker. Her chosen keepsake was her own severed head. Yep, you heard me right. Anne was adamant that her noggin should stay put in Burton Agnes Hall for all eternity. Now, as you can imagine, this caused quite the stir among the Griffith clan. But being the dutiful family they were, they obliged. They popped Anne's skull into the house, hoping it would keep her spirit at bay. 
and for a while it seemed to do the trick. But here's where it gets even spookier. Whenever someone tried to remove the skull, all hell would break loose. I'm talking loud noises, strange happenings, basically your classic haunted house shenanigans. But wait, there's more. Turns out Anne's ghostly antics weren't just confined to the confines of the hall. Oh no, she had a habit of popping up all over the place, terrorizing anyone who dared to cross her path. Traumatized by their spectral sibling, Anne's sisters sought the help of a vicar. Together, they hatched a plan to put her restless spirit to rest once and for all. They dug up Anne's grave, retrieved her skull, and brought it back inside the house where it belonged. And wouldn't you know it, things calmed down pretty quickly after that. As long as Anne's skull stays right where it is, Burton Agnes Hall remains a relatively peaceful place. And Anne keeps her distance, thank goodness for small mercies, right? So there you have it, folks. The tale of Burton Agnes Hall, where the architecture is stunning, the gardens are breathtaking, and the ghostly shenanigans are enough to make your hair stand on end. And all because one young lady had a rather peculiar attachment to her own cranium. Ah, the things we do for family, eh? Hold tight for the next one. Ah, gather round, my fine feathered friend, for I've a tale as old as time itself, or at least as old as Scarborough Castle, nestled snugly on the Yorkshire coast like a forgotten treasure chest. Now picture this, a towering fortress, perched precariously on a craggy headland, its stones soaked in history, and perhaps a splash of blood for good measure. Legend has it, amidst the salty sea air and the cries of gulls, lurks the restless spirit of none other than Piers Gaveston, Earl of Cornwall and bosom buddy to King Edward II. Oh, but here's the kicker. Old Piers is missing a noggin. Yes, you heard me right, his headless form is said to roam the castle's shadows, causing unsuspecting tourists to take an impromptu tumble down the cliffside, landing amidst discarded fish and chip wrappers. Talk about a fright fit to curdle the stoutest of hearts. Now, why this spectral fellow chooses to haunt Scarborough Castle of all places is a mystery as confounding as a riddle wrapped in an enigma. I mean, the poor chap met his grisly end, a good 180 miles away in Warwickshire, where he was unceremoniously beheaded and skewered like a medieval shish kebab on Blacklow Hill. One can't help but wonder if he simply prefers the briny breeze and the squawk of seagulls to the dreary Midlands. But wait, there's more. After the dust settled from the English Civil War, Scarborough Castle became a rather dreary abode for ne'er-do-wells, serving as a prison for those unfortunate souls on the wrong side of the law. And lo and behold, it's said that even in death, these erstwhile inmates couldn't resist a stroll along the beach. Yes, my friend, ghosts apparently fancy a paddle now and then, much to the chagrin of unsuspecting beachgoers. So the next time you find yourself wandering the battlements of Scarborough Castle, keep a weather eye out for old peers and his headless antics. And should you hear a spectral whisper or feel a cold breath upon your neck, just remember, it's all in good jest. Or is it? Hold tight for the next one. Gather round, folks, because I've got a tale to spin that'll have you on the edge of your seat, straight from the depths of the Pantages Theatre's shadowy past. Now imagine the golden age of Hollywood, with Howard Hughes, the smooth-talking businessman extraordinaire at the helm of the legendary Pantages Theatre. This man was so suave, he could charm the socks off a snake. And guess what? He had a little secret up his impeccably tailored sleeve, a secret door hidden away in his office that led straight to a balcony in the theatre itself. Why? Well, legend has it that old Howard liked to do his scheming and plotting in the dark surrounded by the hushed whispers of the theatre's storied past. Some say he fancied himself a mysterious nocturnal maestro, conducting his affairs under the cloak of darkness. But here's where things take a spine-chilling turn. Even in death, Howard couldn't shake off his insatiable work ethic. His ghostly apparition has been spotted prowling the corridors of his former office on the second floor, still calling the shots and keeping a watchful eye over his beloved theatre. I mean, talk about dedication to the job. 
You've got to hand it to the guy. Even in the afterlife, he's still pulling strings and making deals from beyond the grave. Now, fast forward to the turn of the millennium, when the Pantages underwent a massive restoration project. That's when things really started to get eerie. Workers reported seeing a mysterious figure stepping off that balcony, strutting along the scaffolding like it was their own personal catwalk, and then hovering over unsuspecting laborers, scrutinizing their every move with spectral intensity. And when one brave soul finally mustered the courage to confront the phantom intruder, they were met with nothing but empty air, Howard's ghostly presence fading into the ether, leaving behind only a chill in the air and a sense of unease. But hold on to your hats, because the Pantages Theatre isn't just haunted by one restless spirit, it's got its own leading lady ghost too. Legend has it that she met her untimely demise during a show back in 1932, her dreams of stardom tragically cut short. And to this day, her spectral voice still echoes through the hallowed halls of the theatre, her ethereal melodies serenading empty seats and ghostly patrons alike. It's as if she's trapped between worlds, forever chasing the spotlight and longing for the applause that eluded her in life. So, there you have it, my friends. The chilling saga of the Pantages Theatre, where Howard Hughes' ghost still roams the corridors, and a spectral songstress haunts the stage, turning each performance into a spine-tingling spectacle, unlike anything you've ever seen. Welcome to the world of the paranormal, where the show never ends and the ghosts are always waiting in the wings. Hold tight for the next one. Or gather round, my brave souls, and let me regale you with tales of room 333 at the illustrious Langham Hotel in Merylbone. Picture this, a room so haunted, even the most sceptical journalists have been spooked out of their wits. Yes, folks, we're talking about ghosts plenty, not just your run-of-the-mill spectres, mind you, but a whole array of eerie apparitions that'll make your hair stand on end like a frightened hedgehog. Now, who in their right mind wouldn't relish the chance to cosy up in a haunted hotel room? A, but before you rush off to book your stay, let me paint you a vivid picture of the phantoms that call room 333 their spectral stomping grounds. First up, we've got a dashing Victorian gent, a doctor no less, who tragically ended his honeymoon with a murderous twist. Can you imagine? Silver-haired, cloak-clad, and with eyes as vacant as an abandoned mansion. He's been known to make his ghostly rounds in October, giving unsuspecting guests the fright of their lives. But wait, there's more. A beefy German prince with a penchant for early morning strolls through walls. A man with a ghastly wound haunting the hallways. And even Emperor Napoleon III himself, seeking refuge in the hotel's basement in his twilight days. And let's not forget the mischievous spirit who delights in tipping sleeping guests out of their beds, like some spectral prankster with a morbid sense of humor. Rumor has it. One poor soul was so terrified by the ghostly bed shaking that they fled the premises faster than you can say boom. But it's not just the guests who have stories to tell. Oh no, the Langham staff have had their fair share of encounters too. From a butler in holy socks to a footman decked out in powdered wig and pale blue livery, their presence often heralded by a bone-chilling drop in temperature. So, my brave adventurers, are you ready to test your mettle against the phantoms of room 333? Or will you join me in the safety of the nearest non-haunted establishment, where the only thing haunting us is the possibility of a mediocre continental breakfast? <laughs> Hold tight for the next one. Why, my dear friend, I must relate to you a most unsettling tale concerning that bastion of law and order in our fair city, the very Leeds Crown Court itself. For you see, despite its relatively recent provenance, having first admitted advocates and accused alike through its corridors a mere 50 years past, there persists a most stubborn spectre which has reputedly haunted those very precincts for an age. Indeed, my researches indicate that as far back as that long ago year of 1874, a full century before the current edifice was raised, the common folk were drawn to this very site in droves, not to attend court proceedings or bear witness to crimes judged, but in hopes of catching a glimpse of the ethereal entity rumored to drift pale and insubstantial amid the shadows. And what form, you may rightly inquire, does this restless spirit take in its manifold appearances? 
Why, none other than the wizened visage of an aged man, his pate shown bare and gleaming in the gaslight as he passes soundlessly by. A veritable Dorian Gray in reverse, seeming to draw immortality's dread curse about him, like a cloak against heaven's mercy. Laugh if you will at such fanciful tales, my pragmatic companion, but I can avouch that even the stalwart city guards tasked with holding watch over this court of last resort have borne witness to the strange affair. One fellow confided in me that upon spotting the bald apparition gliding down an empty corridor, he gave chase in hopes of resolving the mystery once and for all. Yet no sooner had the wraith, if wraith it was, passed through a innermost chamber door than it dissolved entirely from view. The poor man, at his wit's end, could produce neither hide nor hair of the figure, as if it had disintegrated into the stale courtroom air like so much smoke. And he has not been alone in his terrors, I'm afraid. For on more than one occasion, the night wardens have outright refused to go about their lonely rounds without a corps of stout fellows to accompany them. So shaken were they by previous unnerving encounters with what they now refer to only as Fred. A folksy appellation which belies the true dread those unwholesome fires must have kindled in their breasts. So you see, my friend, the next time you chance to find yourself within the stern confines of that courthouse, offering either testimony or sitting in judgment, you may wish to keep a weather eye cocked toward the dimly lit recesses of the hall, for one can never discount the possibility that an uninvited guest from the other side might decide to pay a visit and scrutinize the proceedings with his own unblinking gaze. If such a happening does indeed come to pass, I can only counsel that you steal your courage and fix your mind resolutely upon the matter at hand. To dwell too long on the mysteries of the spirit realm is a diversion too unsettling by far for mortal constitutions to bear. For as any learned philosopher will aver, some doors were never meant to be opened by the living. Hold tight for the next one. So, gather round folks, let me regale you with a tale as old as Tinseltown itself, centered on the illustrious Culver Studios, a place where Hollywood dreams were spun and legendary films like Gone with the Wind and Raging Bull were brought to life. Picture this, it's 1918, and the silent movie maestro Thomas N.C. decides to grace the world with his very own studio complex. Little did he know, it would become the stage for one of Hollywood's most enduring mysteries. Now N.C. was a man of vision, but alas, his tale took a tragic turn in 1924. Legend has it that during a lavish birthday bash aboard William Randolph Hearst's yacht, N.C. met his untimely demise. Some say it was heart failure, but others whisper of a more scandalous end a bullet meant for Charlie Chaplin, fired by the jealous Hearst himself, who had eyes for Chaplin's gal, Marion Davies. Now fast forward to today, and you've got folks claiming they've seen all Thomas himself sauntering through walls and giving his two cents on studio management. Can you imagine a ghostly critic haunting the very place he helped build? But wait, it doesn't stop there, folks. If you saunter on over to the Culver Hotel, you might just find yourself rubbing elbows with spirits of a different kind. Down in the bar, where the cocktails flow as freely as the tales of yore, guests swear they've encountered ghostly apparitions roaming the halls. And wouldn't you know it, this hotel was once under the same roof as Culver Studios, playing host to none other than the filming of Gone with the Wind. Talk about history, am I right? So, next time you find yourself in the vicinity of Culver Studios or the Culver Hotel, keep your wits about you. You never know when you might catch a glimpse of a ghostly figure from Hollywood's golden age, or perhaps even share a drink with one. Just remember, in Tinseltown, the legends never truly rest in peace. tight for the next one. In the frigid depths of the Ural Mountains, amidst the unforgiving expanse of Soviet Russia in February 1959, a chilling mystery unfurled that would baffle investigators for decades to come. It was the Dyatlov Pass incident, a macabre tableau etched into the icy landscape, where the harsh bite of winter was matched only by the horrors discovered by the search party. Their quest, initially one of rescue, swiftly transformed into a grim odyssey as they stumbled upon a scene straight from a nightmare. 
A tent torn asunder from within, its fabric flayed open like the maw of some ravenous beast. Nine sets of footprints, a haunting trail leading away from the shredded shelter, bearing witness to a frantic flight into the unknown. Some wore only socks, others a solitary shoe, while the bravest trod barefoot upon the icy ground. Their tracks wove a tale of desperation, leading to a forest where a feeble fire cast flickering shadows upon the snow. And there, amidst the eerie glow, lay the first grim discovery two figures clad in knock, but their undergarments, their bodies, succumbing to the merciless embrace of hypothermia. But the horrors did not end there. Three more souls, their lifeless forms strewn nearer to the forsaken tent, hinted at a futile attempt to seek refuge. And then, as if swallowed by the very forest itself, the final four bodies emerged months later, shrouded in layers of clothing scavenged from their fallen companions. Postmortems painted a grim portrait of demise. Hypothermia claimed the first six, yet whispers of violence lingered in the chill mountain air. Broken skulls and ribs bore silent witness to unseen forces, their injuries internal, suggesting a brutality beyond comprehension. And then, the grotesque mutilations, missing tongues, eyes, lips, and eyebrows, a macabre puzzle with no solution in sight. Theories swirled like snowflakes in a blizzard, each one as tantalizingly elusive as the next. Were they victims of a savage assault by local tribesmen or beasts of the wild? The absence of tracks or signs of struggle whispered otherwise. Yeti, unlikely, but who's to say they leave tracks at all? Some whispered of Soviet secrets of clandestine experiments gone awry, veiled in the shadowy cloak of government cover-ups. Others dared to dream of extraterrestrial intervention, sparked by reports of strange orange spheres dancing in the night sky. Yet amidst the clamor of conjecture, one question echoed louder than the howling winds. What truly befell the ill-fated souls of Dyatlov Pass? Avalanche? The very mention seemed to crumble under scrutiny. No evidence of such catastrophe marred the landscape where the bodies lay, the remnants of a feeble fire still clinging to life, and the missing clothes, the haunting absence of eyes and tongues, such mysteries defied the logic of falling snow. Could they have mistaken the roar of parachute mines for the rumble of an avalanche, a fatal misinterpretation that drove them into the cold embrace of death? To this day, the enigma endures, a riddle wrapped in the icy embrace of the Ural Mountains. Theories rise and fall like snowflakes upon the wind, each one tantalizingly close yet maddeningly elusive. Catabolic winds, Carmen Vortex's whispers of phenomena both natural and supernatural, yet none can fully unravel the tangled web of mystery that shrouds Diablov Pass. Like shadows cast upon the snow, they hint at truths just beyond reach, leaving only the bitter chill of uncertainty in their wake. Hold tight for the next one. Gather round, gather round, my dear companions, for I've got a yarn that'll have you grinning like a Cheshire cat and scratching your noggin in wonderment. Picture this. Nestled snug as a bug beneath the charming facade of the townhouse restaurant in Venice lies the infamous Del Monte speakeasy. Now back in the roaring days of prohibition when the law turned its nose up at the mere mention of a tipple, this joint was the bee's knees, keeping the hooch flowing through secret underground passages that now serve as nothing more than dreary utility corridors. Legend has it that old Frank Bennett, bless his soul, was the mastermind behind this boozy haven. From 72 till he kicked the bucket in 203, Frank ran the joint with the finesse of a circus ringmaster. But here's the rub. Whispers abound that Frank, may he rest in peace, still saunters the dusty floorboards of his cherished corner booth, casting a spectral eye over the merry patrons from across the bar. Venice, you see, was a wild and woolly place back in the day, especially when it came to quenching one's thirst for the forbidden fruit. Now, Carradine, bless his cotton socks, reckons this speakeasy is a downright curious anomaly. It's one of the oldest watering holes in the whole darn city of angels, yet it's got itself one of them shiny new ghosts. Yep, old Bennett's spirit supposedly keeps a weather eye on his beloved haunt from beyond the grave. 
And let me tell you, it's quite the sight to behold. A phantom from days of yore rubbing shoulders with the modern day revelers like a slice of history served with a side of cocktails. <laughs> Hold tight for the next one. The Sissel Hotel, shrouded in its own dark history, stands as a silent witness to the eerie and the macabre. Among its chilling tales, the name Black Dahlia echoes alongside the haunting presence of the notorious night stalker Richard Ramirez. Yet perhaps the most perplexing enigma to unfold within its walls dates back to February 1, 2013. Alyssa Lamb, a Canadian college student, vanished without a trace while lodging at the Cecil. The LAPD unveiled the final recorded moments of her existence, capturing a sequence that defied rational explanation. In the footage, Alyssa steps into the hotel's elevator, her demeanor seemingly ordinary. But then, a surreal ballet unfolds as she maneuvers within the confined space, her actions akin to a spectral performance. She pirouettes, presses every button, and contorts her body in peculiar ways, as if engaging with unseen forces. Initially, speculation veered towards drug involvement, given the bizarre nature of her behavior. Yet, accounts from hotel staff portrayed her as vibrant and sociable during her stay. Despite exhaustive searches by law enforcement, including scouring the hotel's every nook and cranny, no traces of Alyssa emerged. It wasn't until February 19th that a grim discovery altered the course of the investigation. Guests began to notice unsettling irregularities in the water supply low pressure and discolored liquid tainted with an unusual taste. The caretaker ascended to the rooftop, where a ghastly revelation awaited him. Peering into one of the water tanks, he beheld Alyssa's lifeless form unclothed and submerged, her attire resting beside her encrusted with an unidentifiable substance akin to sand. The manner of her demise posed an insurmountable puzzle. Accessing the rooftop required navigating through alarmed passageways, monitored by vigilant surveillance systems. Even if one bypassed these security measures, gaining entry to the water tanks demanded a feat of physical dexterity, rendering her ascent and subsequent submergence nigh implausible. The post-mortem examination offered no conclusive answers, no signs of violence, no traces of recreational drugs beyond a negligible alcohol presence. Her online presence hauntingly persisted beyond the veil of death, with her Tumblr account updating posthumously, casting an eerie shadow over the entire investigation. The enigma of Alyssa Lamb persists, perpetuating a maelstrom of theories and conjecture. The haunting footage continues to circulate, a spectral echo of a life extinguished under inexplicable circumstances, leaving behind a legacy steeped in the inexplicable and the otherworldly. Hold tight for the next one. Ah, let me regale you with a whimsical saga of Grey Gardens, a grandiose estate nestled in the opulent bosom of East Hampton. Picture this, a sprawling four-acre haven in the prestigious Georgica Beach Enclave, where in 1895, a couple of highfalutin tycoons decided to stake their claim before erecting the manor in the early 1900s. Come 1913, it found its way into the clutches of a coal magnate, whose better half, Anna Gilman Hill, imported these ostentatious concrete walls all the way from Spain to encircle the garden. And thus, Grey Gardens earned its moniker, owing to the ashen hue of the dunes, the stony embrace of those walls, and the mystical mist of the sea. But hold on to your top hats, for in 1923, the torch was passed to none other than Edith Bouvier Beale, kin to the illustrious Jackie Anasis Kennedy and Lee Radziwill. Alas, fortune frowned upon them, and a cascade of calamities befell the manor, leading it down the path of neglect and desolation. Rumor has it the place became a haven not just for cats and raccoons, but perhaps even some ethereal entities. Enter Big Eddie Beale and her daughter, Little Eddie Beale, who found themselves unable to keep up with the upkeep, thus allowing the mansion to fall into disarray. But fear not, for their tale filled with a pinch of stardust was immortalized in the reels of a 1975 documentary by the Maisel's brothers. Now here's where the plot thickens like a hearty stew left to simmer. Big Eddie clung to her domain until her final curtain call in 1977, 
Yet legend whispers that her spirit still roams the halls of Grey Gardens, a spectral custodian of its faded glory. And who should step into this spectral spotlight but Sally Quinn, the esteemed wordsmith of the Washington Post, who in 1979 boldly took the reins from little Eddie herself. And mark my words, dear friend, she swears by the old gods and the new that Grey Gardens is haunted to its very foundation. Hold tight for the next one. Deep in the heart of Hollywood, there exists an establishment that serves up more than just sushi and sake. This, my dear friend, is Yamashiro, a Japanese restaurant perched high above the cityscape on Sycamore Avenue. But the flickering lights of LA aren't the only things that illuminate the night here. Oh no, it seems the spectral spectacles within Yamashiro provide their own eerie glow. Indeed, patrons have shared tales of a former bartender who refuses to vacate his post, even in death. His ghostly figure, they say, continues to serve up spirits of a different kind, adding a supernatural twist to their cocktails. And if you're planning a wedding here, brace yourself for an uninvited guest. A mournful bride, doomed to eternal sorrow, is said to inhabit the bridal suite. Her wails echo through the halls, chilling the blood of those who dare to listen. Yet when you rush to comfort her, you'll find the room devoid of life. As if that's not enough, you may also encounter the spirit of Thomas O. Glover, the former owner. His ashes are said to be buried in the garden courtyard, and his spectral presence is still felt, overseeing his beloved property from beyond the grave. But the most haunting tale of all centers around a weeping woman, a permanent resident of the second floor. Her sorrowful sobs echo through the halls, chilling even the bravest of hearts. Some say she was a lady of the night during Yamashiro's days as a brothel, her life ending in tragedy. Now, she wanders the corridors in a state of perpetual despair. So, my brave friend, the question remains, do you have the courage to venture into Yamashiro and confront its spectral inhabitants? Do you dare to dine amongst the spirits, to taste the thrill of the unknown, and to delve into the mysteries that lie within its walls? The choice is yours. Venture to Yamashiro and see for yourself. Who knows, you might even make a new spectral friend. tight for the next one. So, picture this. You're standing at London Bridge, surrounded by the hustle and bustle of modern-day London. The cars are whizzing by, the chatter of tourists fills the air, and the iconic bridge stretches across the River Thames, a symbol of the city's rich history. But beneath your feet lies a hidden world, a dark and mysterious realm steeped in centuries of bloodshed and tragedy. Centuries ago, during the height of the bubonic plague, London was gripped by fear and death. The plague ravaged the city, claiming the lives of thousands. With nowhere else to put the bodies, they were unceremoniously dumped into mass graves beneath London Bridge. Imagine the horror of those times, the stench of death hanging heavy in the air, as carts piled high with corpses made their way through the cobblestone streets. Fast forward to today, and those same tombs have become part of the London Bridge experience, a chilling journey through the city's dark past. As you descend into the depths of the earth, you can feel the weight of history pressing down upon you. The air grows colder, the shadows dance ominously along the walls, and you can't shake the feeling that you're being watched. The London Bridge experience itself is a roller coaster ride through time, from the Roman invasion to the Great Fire of London and beyond. But it's the tombs that really steal the show. Only the bravest souls dare to venture into these eerie chambers, where the spirits of the past are said to roam. And then there's Emily, a ghostly figure said to haunt the tombs. No one knows her story for sure. But she's been spotted by countless visitors, her ethereal presence sending shivers down their spines. Some have even claimed to feel her cold breath on the back of their necks, a ghostly whisper echoing in their ears. But perhaps the most unsettling thing of all is the tale of the mysterious actor. Visitors on certain tours have reported feeling like they're being watched, only to discover that one of the actors isn't quite what they seem. Instead of playing their part, 
They simply stand and stare, their eyes boring into your soul. And that's when you realize it's not an actor at all. It's Emily, reaching out from beyond the grave to remind us that some secrets are best left buried. Hold tight for the next one. Nestled across from one of Savannah's most illustrious squares, Monterey Square, shrouded in the mystique of the city's historic district, stands the Mercer Williams House, a relic of the antebellum era dating back to 1860. Once left to the ravages of time, it was resurrected from neglect in the 1970s by the renowned preservationist and connoisseur of antiquities, Jim Williams. Within the elegant confines of this Italianate revival, the echoes of tragedy resonate through the corridors. The specter of untimely demise haunts its halls, from the heart-wrenching plunge of 11-year-old Tommy Downs from its rooftop in 1969, to the fateful 1981 altercation, culminating in the fatal shooting of Danny Hansford by Williams himself. The saga of Williams continued with his own demise, less than a year following his acquittal in a fourth trial meeting his end in the very room where Hansford drew his last breath. Their intertwined narrative etched into the annals of history, immortalized in the best-selling chronicle, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Yet beneath the veneer of grandeur lies a darker tale, whispered in hushed tones among the locals. Rumors persist of the house's foundation resting atop unmarked graves, fueling the lore of restless spirits and spectral visitations that linger long after dusk descends. While the Mercer Williams House Museum opens its doors to curious visitors, there exists a palpable reluctance to embrace its spectral reputation. Dr. Dorothy Kingery, custodian of her late brother's legacy, remains reticent on matters concerning Jim Williams's notorious past, dismissing conjecture of paranormal phenomena with steadfast resolve. Despite her steadfast denial, the allure of ghostly encounters persists, recounted by those who dare to tread the threshold of the house after nightfall. At the heart of this saga looms the enigmatic figure of Jim Williams, a man enshrined in infamy and controversy. Divisive accounts paint him as either a cold-blooded killer or a misunderstood eccentric. Even in death, the specter of judgment follows him, with Judge George Edward Oliver's damning indictment echoing through the corridors of time. Yet, amidst the conflicting narratives, one undeniable truth remains. Williams found no respite from his tumultuous existence his final days haunted by the shadows of his own making. Since his passing, whispers abound among the house staff, of spectral apparitions roaming the dimly lit corridors, bearing the likeness of the departed master. Witnesses speak of encounters with Jim Williams' ghost, his ethereal form pacing the halls in silent lament, a spectral reminder of a tumultuous past that refuses to be laid to rest. Hold tight for the next one. Ah, mate. Let me regale you with a tale that'll send shivers down your spine, straight from the heart of London's East End. Picture this. The Ten Bells Pub. A place steeped in history, where the echoes of the past linger like the smoke from a long-extinguished pipe. Formerly known as the Jack the Ripper, it's got a reputation that precedes it evoking memories of old Jack himself. Legend has it that in the 90s, the landlord swore blind that Annie Chapman's ghost had taken up residence within these very walls. Annie, bless her soul, was one of Jack's unfortunate victims. Since then, folks have whispered tales of spectral sightings and mischievous poltergeist pranks. With tables dancing and chairs taking a life of their own, makes you wonder, doesn't it, what lurks within those barrels? Or perhaps something far more sinister is at play. Now here's the kicker. The Ten Bells and Jack the Ripper, they go way back. It's said that some of Jack's victims, God rest their souls, were regulars here before their tragic demise. Take Elizabeth Stride, for instance, thrown out for causing a ruckus in the spring of 88. Or Mary Kelly, spotted sharing a drink with a friend just before her untimely end. And as for Annie Chapman, well, rumor has it, she was knocking back a pint here mere hours before her grisly fate befell her. With ties like that to the Ripper himself, 
It's no wonder that Ten Bells has become a hotspot for ghost hunters and thrill seekers alike. But wait, there's more. Over the years, both staff and punters have reported eerie apparitions haunting the pub. Could they have caught a glimpse of the Ripper's ghost prowling these very halls? Now brace yourself for the tale of the murdered baby. Picture this. A psychic, called in to investigate the spectral stirrings within the pub. All's well until she reaches the top floor where she outright refuses to enter a room. Why? Something dreadful, she says, involving the tragic demise of a 19th century infant. Fast forward a few years, and a researcher uncovers a sack hidden behind a water tank in the roof space. Inside, a set of decrepit baby clothes dating back to Victorian times, slashed with a knife. And guess where this eerie find was located? Right above the very room the psychic had pointed out. But hold on to your hat because the story doesn't end there. In 2001, a tenant experienced something straight out of a horror flick. Footsteps, laughter, and the feeling of being watched, all when he was alone in the pub. Investigate as he might, the corridor remained empty, and as if that wasn't enough, he'd occasionally feel a nudge, a push from an invisible hand, as he made his way down to the bar. So, fancy a pint at the Ten Bells? Who knows, you might just leave with a story to tell that'll make your hair stand on end. <laughs> Ah, the tale of the silent movie theater. Hold tight for the next one. Once a haven for cinematic wonders, now a stage for a saga as intricate as any blockbuster drama. Picture this, a theater born from the passion of its founder, John Hampton, who in 1942 defied the era's trend of discarding silent films by showcasing his personal collection. Little did he know that his preservation efforts soaked in toxic chemicals in the very bathtub above his heater, would seal his fate, hastening his demise in 1990, claimed by the relentless grip of cancer. Enter Lawrence Austin, Hampton's protege, who inherited the theater and its tangled legacy. But fate, it seems, had a darker role scripted for this stage. In 1997, amidst the flickering glow of projected images, tragedy struck as Austin met his end in a hail of bullets, courtesy of a hired gun, the plot thickens as revelations unravel, a tale of betrayal, conspiracy, and deceit. For it was Austin's own confidant, James Van Sickle, the theater's projectionist and lover, who orchestrated the macabre scene, weaving a web of lies claiming ownership through a dubious handwritten will. But justice, though delayed, ultimately prevailed, as Van Sickle and his hired hand found themselves ensnared in the cold embrace of incarceration, serving life sentences for their sins. Yet. Amidst the whispers of the past, echoes linger within the theater's walls, bearing witness to the lingering presence of those whose lives were claimed by its dark embrace. A guest, brave or perhaps unwittingly curious, recounts the chilling scene she witnessed, a body sprawled in the lobby, a memory haunting her steps ever since. They say spirits still roam these hallowed halls, the ghost of Lawrence Austin trapped in eternal unrest, his presence felt in the very air of the lobby he once walked, and John Hampton, his spirit wandering the second floor where he once dwelled, a silent sentinel to the theater's tumultuous history. Such is the tale of the silent movie theater, where the reel of reality blends seamlessly with the shadows of the past, a drama fit for the silver screen itself. Hold tight for the next one. Ah, the tale of the silent movie theater. Once a haven for cinematic wonders, now a stage for a saga as intricate as any blockbuster drama. Picture this, a theater born from the passion of its founder, John Hampton, who in 1942 defied the era's trend of discarding silent films by showcasing his personal collection. Little did he know that his preservation efforts, soaked in toxic chemicals in the very bathtub above his heater, would seal his fate, hastening his demise in 1990, claimed by the relentless grip of cancer. Enter Lawrence Austin, Hampton's protege, who inherited the theater and its tangled legacy. But fate, it seems, had a darker role scripted for this stage. In 1997, 
Amidst the flickering glow of projected images, tragedy struck as Austin met his end in a hail of bullets, courtesy of a hired gun. The plot thickens as revelations unravel, a tale of betrayal, conspiracy, and deceit. For it was Austin's own confidant, James Van Sickle, the theater's projectionist and lover, who orchestrated the macabre scene, weaving a web of lies claiming ownership through a dubious handwritten will. But justice, though delayed, ultimately prevailed, as Van Sickle and his hired hand found themselves ensnared in the cold embrace of incarceration, serving life sentences for their sins. Yet, amidst the whispers of the past, echoes linger within the theater's walls, bearing witness to the lingering presence of those whose lives were claimed by its dark embrace. A guest, brave or perhaps unwittingly curious, recounts the chilling scene she witnessed, a body sprawled in the lobby, a memory haunting her steps ever since. They say spirits still roam these hallowed halls, the ghost of Lawrence Austin trapped in eternal unrest, his presence felt in the very air of the lobby he once walked, and John Hampton, his spirit wandering the second floor where he once dwelled, a silent sentinel to the theater's tumultuous history. Such is the tale of the silent movie theater, where the reel of reality blends seamlessly with the shadows of the past, a drama fit for the silver screen itself. Hold tight for the next one. Ah, the Queen Mary, a vessel steeped in history, its very timbers whispering tales of bygone eras and spectral encounters. Once a paragon of luxury, ferrying the elite across the vast expanse of the Atlantic, she now stands as a testament to the passage of time, her once opulent halls echoing with the faint murmurs of the restless dead. They say her transformation from a grand dame of the seas to a spectral haunt began with the outbreak of World War II. Drafted into service as a ferry ship, she shed her elegant veneer, cloaked instead in the somber hues of wartime necessity. Renamed the Grey Ghost, she bore witness to the horrors of conflict, ferrying troops to distant shores and back again, her decks awash with the blood and sweat of brave souls. Yet even in peacetime, the Queen Mary's legacy of the macabre persisted. Sold to a tour operator and moored in Long Beach, she became a floating hotel and event venue, her once bustling corridors now silent save for the eerie whispers that danced upon the air. According to the late Peter James, a renowned psychic and ghost hunter, the Queen Mary teems with restless spirits, each one a testament to the ship's tumultuous past. From the second-class pool deck to the depths of engine room 13, no corner of her hallowed halls remains untouched by the specter of the supernatural. Foremost among her ghostly denizens is the spirit of Stateroom B340, a place so fraught with paranormal activity that even the bravest among the crew dare not venture within. Tales abound of its haunted history, from the mysterious demise of third-class passenger Walter J. Adamson in 1948, to the grisly fate of a man locked within its confines, torn asunder by unseen forces in the dead of night. Such is the allure of the Queen Mary, a vessel adrift in time, her secrets shrouded in the mists of legend and lore. And as the sun sets on her weathered hull, one can't help but wonder what otherworldly encounters await those who dare to tread her haunted decks. Hold tight for the next one. In the shadowed realm of Highgate Cemetery, where the departed slumber beneath centuries-old stones, one might expect a quiet reverence to prevail. Yet, as history would have it, this resting place has become a stage for the bizarre and the inexplicable. In the annals of the 70s, a sinister presence prowled the mist-laden paths, casting a chill upon the hearts of locals. Amidst whispers and conjecture, a certain Sean Manchester, a magician of dubious repute, ventured forth with the audacity to proclaim the presence of a vampire. Absurd, one might think, for what creature of the night would find solace amidst the solemnity of the dead? Alas, on the eve of his fateful pursuit, Mr. Manchester vanished into the ether, leaving behind naught but speculation and a lingering sense of foreboding. But let us not dwell on the fanciful notion of bloodsuckers, 
for the true spectres that haunt Highgate are far more enigmatic. Among them, the spirit of Karl Marx himself, his ideology lingering like an ethereal mist among the tombstones, ever in search of souls ripe for philosophical discourse. Yet, it is the tale of the tall, dark figure that stirs the most fervent debate among the denizens of Muswell Hill. With eyes ablaze with otherworldly fire, it stalks the grounds with a silent malevolence, striking fear into the hearts of those unfortunate enough to cross its path. David Farrant, a man of local renown, dared to voice his encounters with a grey apparition on that eerie Christmas Eve of 69, igniting a conflagration of supernatural sightings that gripped the community in a vice of terror. In the wake of these unsettling events, the air crackled with hysteria as self-proclaimed exorcists and intrepid vampire hunters descended upon the cemetery gates, their presence invoking chaos and desecration. Graves were violated, corpses defiled, all in the name of quelling the restless spirits that roamed the hallowed grounds. Amidst this maelstrom of madness, David Farrant found himself ensnared in the tendrils of the law accused of crimes most foul in his pursuit of spiritual enlightenment. And yet, despite the scorn of society, he stood defiant, a beacon of defiance against the encroaching darkness. Thus, the saga of Highgate Cemetery unfolds, a tapestry woven with threads of fear and fascination, where the boundaries between the living and the dead blur into obscurity, and the whispered promises of the paranormal beckon with an irresistible allure. Hold tight for the next one. In the rugged embrace of the Sam Merrill trailhead where the foothills cradle the Cobb estate, lies a realm both haunting and hallowed. Once hailed as a haven for weary travelers seeking solace amidst nature's embrace, the estate now harbors secrets whispered on the wind and etched into the time-worn stones. The tale of its transformation finds its genesis in the tumultuous era of the 1950s, when the illustrious Marx brothers, renowned for their wit and whimsy, cast their gaze upon the land. With a stroke of fate, they breathed new life into the decaying mansion, sparing it from the jaws of oblivion. Little did they know that their act of preservation would birth a sanctuary for those on the fringes of society, where the forgotten sought shelter amidst its dilapidated walls. As time wove its tapestry, the Cobb estate became more than a mere refuge. It evolved into a nexus where the tangible and intangible converged. Echoes of laughter and footsteps of long-departed souls whispered through the corridors, mingling with the rustle of leaves in the haunted forest beyond. In the modern epic, the estate casts a different allure, drawing forth a new breed of pilgrims, bold youths emboldened by tales of phantoms and apparitions. Under the cloak of night, they venture forth, their hearts quickened by the promise of encountering the otherworldly. Though the forest stands sparse and desolate, the remnants of the mansion's foundation serve as a stage for the ethereal, where spectral echoes resonate upon the surviving staircase, and the shadows themselves seem to dance with a life of their own. Amidst the ebb and flow of time, the Cobb estate remains a beacon, beckoning both the curious and the courageous to venture into the unknown, where the boundaries between the seen and unseen blur, and the mysteries of the haunted forest reveal themselves to those brave enough to seek them. <coughs> Hold tight for the next one. Greenwich. The mere mention of its name sends shivers down the spine, for it is a place where the past lingers like a haunting melody. At the heart of this enigmatic locale stands the Queen's House, a silent witness to the spectral dance that unfolds within its ancient walls. 1966 marked the year when the Reverend Hardy, a man of faith, ventured into the embrace of Greenwich's mysteries with his faithful wife by his side. Drawn by whispers of a staircase so beguiling it seemed to defy time itself, the Reverend aimed his lens and captured a moment that would echo through eternity. It was a simple act, a photograph taken in admiration, yet when the image emerged from the depths of the dark room, it revealed more than mere wood and stone. Two apparitions, ethereal and fleeting, ascended the stairs in silent communion, defying explanation or reason. 
The Reverend and his wife swore solemn oaths that no living soul accompanied them in that moment of frozen time. But time, relentless in its passage, has not dulled the curiosity nor quenched the whispers that echo through the corridors of the Queen's house. Who were these spectral visitors lingering between worlds? The answer eludes even the most steadfast of seekers, leaving only questions in its wake. And yet, the dance of the spirits continues, weaving through the tapestry of history with ghostly grace. In 2002, a gallery assistant, unsuspecting and unaware, bore witness to the ethereal presence that still calls Greenwich home. A figure, cloaked in the garments of antiquity, glided across the balcony with silent purpose, vanishing into the very fabric of reality itself. Such is the legacy of Greenwich, where the past and present intertwine in a timeless waltz, inviting the brave and the curious to step into the unknown and seek answers that may forever elude mortal understanding. Hold tight for the next one. The Colorado Street Bridge, a marvel completed in 1913, cast its shadow over Pasadena's tales since its inception. Its first dark embrace was claimed in 1919, thereafter becoming a stage for tragedies untold. Carradine, a man steeped in the lore, recounted the chilling whispers that echo along its rails and under its arches. People speak of apparitions, Carradine began, his voice tinged with a blend of awe and fear. A man takes a leap into the abyss, Yet upon approach he vanishes into thin air. A spectral woman traverses the bridge, her form elusive, fading like mist before the eyes of startled motorists. Carradine himself danced with the bridge's ghostly whispers. In the dead of night beneath the bridge's arches, my companion and I walked, he revealed. Lights flickered and died in succession as we passed, leaving naught but darkness in our wake. The bridge's dark history deepened in 1932, as another soul met its end in a fatal plunge. Whispers spoke of a departed builder, his spectral hand guiding lost souls to their fate, though truth shunned such tales. Over the years, the bridge's toll grew, surpassing 150 lives lost to its siren call. Tales abound of spectral figures haunting its spans, a woman leaping then vanishing, a man muttering cryptic accusations to startled onlookers. In 93, a $27 million endeavor cloaked the bridge in steel, a barrier to thwart despair's embrace. Yet its grasp proved tenacious, slowing but not halting the tragedies. Talks lingered of a permanent barrier, met with resistance from the bridge's ardent admirers, who, while acknowledging its necessity, mourned the intrusion. The bridge's narrative is etched in sorrow, its haunting whispers echoing through the annals of California's most spectral locales. Hold tight for the next one. The Tower of London has been a notorious prison for nearly a thousand years. Many famous people lost their heads within its walls. Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII, was beheaded at the Tower in 1536. Her restless spirit is said to wander the grounds, clutching her severed head to her side. Other ghostly prisoners have been seen and heard wailing and roaming aimlessly as ghosts are known to do. The tower is considered one of the most haunted places in London, with countless reports of apparitions over the centuries. Visitors have claimed to see the ghosts of Anne Boleyn, Lady Jane Grey, and other historical figures who met tragic ends within the tower's confines. The unfortunate Guy Fawkes was imprisoned and likely tortured on the rack in the White Tower dungeons after his failed gunpowder plot to assassinate King James I at, in 1605. Some believe his agonized screams can still be heard echoing through the thick stone walls. In a particularly chilling tale, a soldier in 1679 reported seeing a procession of ghostly knights and ladies passing through the chapel, led by the headless specter of Anne Boleyn herself. He had climbed to look through the window after noticing a mysterious light burning inside the locked chapel, where Anne was laid to rest after her execution. The young King Henry VI was imprisoned in the Wakefield Tower, where he was murdered at midnight in 1471 while kneeling at the altar of the King's private chapel. His ghost 
is thought to materialize in the Wakefield Tower every year on the anniversary of his death. In the 13th century, King Henry III kept a menagerie of exotic animals in the tower grounds, including lions, leopards, pumas, tigers, and even an elephant and polar bear sent from abroad as gifts. The popular blood sport of bear baiting was carried out for entertainment in those days. Perhaps it is the restless spirit of one of those tormented bears that is said to appear from behind the door of the jewel room or near the Martin Tower as a shaggy black apparition glimpsed in 1816. The dashing Sir Walter Raleigh was imprisoned in the bloody tower for over 13 years by both Elizabeth I and James I. He attempted suicide during this final confinement in the Beauchamp Tower before being executed outside the Palace of Westminster. In 1957, a Welsh guard encountered a strange, faceless female form at the Salt Tower, possibly one of the many tragic women who suffered within these walls over the ages. Like the infamous Anne, the elderly Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, was beheaded on the Tower Green in 1541 on Henry VIII's orders, simply for being the mother of a man who opposed the King's break with the Catholic Church. Her awful, drawn-out execution at the hands of an inept executioner is said to be relived each night as her anguished screams resound through the towers. On another dark occasion, a yeoman warder, one of the tower's famous beef-eater guards, was seen charging his bayonet at a ghostly white female figure in the courtyard where Anne Boleyn met her end. The nine days Queen Lady Jane Grey was executed alongside her husband in 1554 after briefly being put on the throne by devious advisers of the late King Edward VI. Jane's innocence and pitifully brief taste of power make her one of the tower's most tragic figures. It is said her pale form can be seen keeping a silent vigil along the battlements where she was put to death. In the corridors, you may hear the unmistakable sound of sandals slapping against the stone, the footsteps of a ghostly monk who once walked these halls when the tower contained a religious order. The melancholy Arbella Stuart, cousin of Elizabeth I, haunts the Queen's house where she was imprisoned and starved by paranoid King James for daring to marry without his approval. And in the most heartbreaking tale, the small skeletons of the two young princes in the tower, the sons of Edward IV, who were imprisoned by their monstrous uncle, were found buried unceremoniously beneath the stairwell. The pitiful child ghosts of Edward V and Richard are said to continue their horrifying, unending confinement in the place of their murder. But perhaps most chilling of all is the presence of the Nameless Thing, a primordial, malevolent force far older than any of the tower's other wretched spectral inhabitants. This formless being is reported to trail and menace the night guards as they walk their river entrance route, as if some unspeakable evil still haunts the most ancient grounds of this dreadful place. The secret of its foulness is one few dare contemplate. Hold tight for the next one. The old White House was a place of phantoms and shades. Restless spirits who would not be quieted, Abe Lincoln's tall ghost walked those halls heaviest of all. That rail-splitter president, shot dead in the crimson night by the play actor's bullet. Men of stout heart glimpsed Lincoln's apparition roaming. The rough rider Teddy Roosevelt. The English bulldog Winston Churchill puffing his cigar amid the specters and Eleanor her own self felt that lorn presence breathing in the bedroom, named for her husband's fallen forebearer. But Lincoln's was not the only revenant loosened upon that house. His small son Willie, dead in those strangled war years, drifted ever behind his father's long strides, a sad wisp of a shade following the way a lost child clings to whatever reminders of home remain. Poor Mary Lincoln heard them both, her husband's firm tread, the tiny footfalls of her lost babe, she took solace in dark spirit channelings desperate to ease such all-consuming grief. Housemaids crossed themselves at every creak and cold draft of immortal visitants. Old Jerry the footman heard their cries and shuddered. Lincoln, Grant, McKinley, the ghostly tramp of armies forever marching from civilization's farthest fields. He spooked the young servant girls with his haint tales till inflexible taff threatened the sack for any more such oddments. Over the decades they ebbed and flowed these lorn remnants of power and loss. 
From Willie's baleful thing to the nameless boy spirit who pressed its terrible weight on unsuspecting shoulders, all pleading from past to present, begging to be given witness and remembrance still. The grounds cupped their ancient groans in the moistened earth where so many had trod before. Unquiet spirits would not be stilled as new families came and supplanted the old, destined in turn to flee home forever. Lincoln's ghost remained ever towering and sorrowful amid the uncountable voices crying out, until the time when all shall be rejoined beyond this veil, or death takes even whispered memories at last into oblivion's void. Hold tight for the next one. Clink Street. Who would have thought an old renovated prison could be ground zero for so many ghastly hauntings? The Clink was notoriously one of the most brutal prisons of the Middle Ages. Prisoners were routinely beaten and starved, all at the behest of the church running the jail. It must have been a waking nightmare to be alive back then. Plague, evil prisons, no reality shows for entertainment, a true living hell on earth. The very name Clink now evokes the eerie sounds of unseen spirits rattling chains and cell doors in this former house of torment, now turned museum. Though shuttered for 300 years, visitors still swear they witness ghostly apparitions of guards and inmates wandering the halls. One frequently reported spectre is that of a wretched female prisoner, forever trying in vain to remove the shackles and irons that bound her in life. The authorities at the Clink were by all accounts sadistic, mentally unwell, and utterly lacking empathy. The church allowed cruel and inhumane punishments like starvation, solitary confinement, and vicious beatings, all in the name of rehabilitation. It's no surprise such barbaric practices have left restless, disturbed souls paying an eternal penance within these walls, where they experienced unfathomable suffering. Those brave enough to tour the clink regularly report encounters with the supernatural. Shadowy shapes of prisoners and their tormentors are seen. Unexplained noises like footsteps and slamming cell doors echo constantly, as if the anguished cries and daily routine of horror still replay in some awful continual loop. Specific ghosts are seldom witnessed repeatedly, but that same desperate female shade is frequently glimpsed and heard, her wrists and ankles seemingly weighed down forever by the cruel restraints of a punishing, unjust life. tight for the next one. Ah, the City Varieties Music Hall, a venerable edifice regaining its faded splendor after a Victorian rebirth in our modern age. Within those hallowed walls where the footlights once bathed upturned faces in their flickering radiance, strange phantasms now tread the boards when the living have departed. Tis said by the hall's very staff, that eerie visitations are commonplace in the haunted hush after performances. Pianos bereft of human hands caress the midnight air with mournful refrains. Hollow knocks and thunderous bangs as if from spectres vying for the stage issue from the main bar when all is locked and shuttered. And a mysterious crimson tressed bouncer is off scene policing the aisles during shows, her spectral presence auguring either rapturous success or downcast failure for that evening's entertainment. But strangest of all bewitchments are the disturbed portraits hung about the hall's chambers. Those staring visages, rendered in colourful oils upon the canvases, seem to warp and contort into frantic paroxysms of fear, as if afflicted by some dread force. The subject's eyes bulge wild, their mouths twist in silent screams, shuddering brushstrokes bleeding across once placid features. As if some formless panic from the great beyond reached gnawing tendrils to scribble madness upon their captured countenances. I, the night watchman, relate witnessing such eldritch transfigurations when the auditorium lies quiescent and the moon's sickly luminance paints the velvet drapes. But worse, far worse, are the bodiless limbs reported in shadowed alcoves. Pale, disconnected legs skipping up the back stairs in a perverse cavorting. Disembodied hands clawing at the dusty air in lonesome, futile desperation. 
Why one poor caretaker barely escaped unsummering his wits after falling asleep on duty, only to awake and behold a leering, severed feminine visage floating impishly above his petrified form. Oh, the harrowing night frights and baleful manifestations which lurk in that charmed music hall's eaves and lofts. Well might the stoutest of souls blanch spineless to think on what profane hoardings from spectral limbos might bear. Luck happened passenger across those accursed precincts when the midnight chimes sound their harbinger knell. Shuddering fen ghouls and skirling vampire hosts congregating to slake their nihilistic fevers upon the damned rafters and proscenia. Agar! The mind quails and sickens to ponder such path-born immunities in their putre. Hold tight for the next one. In the depths of New York City, where the pulse of life thrums beneath the surface, ghosts linger like shadows in the alleys and whispers in the wind. The ghosts of Greenwich Village scavenger hunt promises a dance with specters aplenty, yet venture farther uptown and you'll find yourself at the doorstep of the Dakota. This grand abode standing sentinel on Central Park West, witness the macabre dance of Rosemary's baby on its celluloid stage but it also bore witness to the tragic finale of John Lennon's earthly symphony. In the realm of the living, Lennon regaled tales of a spectral mourner he christened the Crying Lady, a phantom he purportedly glimpsed amidst the shadows of the Dakota's halls. But in the shroud of death, he himself became a revenant, making spectral sojourns to both the staff and denizens of this historic edifice, even to his beloved Yoko Ono in the twilight between worlds. Amongst its storied corridors, the Dakota has harbored luminaries such as Lauren Bacall, Judy Garland, and the lyrical genius of Lennon. But beneath its illustrious facade lurks a darker narrative, the legend of the Crying Lady. Whispers weave through the tapestry of time, painting the Crying Lady as a specter born of sorrow, a woman ensnared in the gilded cage of opulence. Legend spins her tale as that of a once vibrant beauty, ensconced in the opulent chambers of the Dakota's upper echelons. Married to a titan of industry whose pursuits kept him tethered to distant lands, she found solace only in the silent company of her ornate abode. Yet, as the hours stretched into eternity and the echo of her husband's absence reverberated through the hallowed halls, loneliness descended like a shroud, ensnaring her in its suffocating embrace. Desolation gnawed at her spirit, etching lines of despair upon her porcelain visage, until, like the fading notes of a melancholy melody, she became a ghost of her former self, a wraith doomed to haunt the corridors of the Dakota for all eternity. Hold tight for the next one. Ah, gather round, dear friend, for I've a tale of intrigue and mystery to share, one that'll send shivers down your spine. Picture, if you will, the ancient abode of the Hassett family a dwelling steeped in history and whispers of the otherworldly. So thick was the air with the presence of spirits and spectres that the Hassett's brave souls they are sought out none other than the dreadfully renowned television program Haunted Homes to bear witness to the eerie occurrences that plagued their residents. The Hassett clan spoke of strange echoes that danced through their halls, emanating from the very heart of their hearth. Paintings, innocently hung, took flight without warning, crashing to the floor in defiance of gravity's grasp. And mark my words, their loyal hounds, faithful companions though they be, dared not tread the cold depths of the cellar, a place where even the bravest soul might hesitate to venture. Now, it's a mystery as deep as the well in their cellar as to who or what lurks within the time-worn walls of this three five zero year old abode, once a bustling coaching inn in days of yore. Since the Hassets made this ancient dwelling their own some two decades past, a chorus of eerie phenomena has echoed through its halls, chilling the very marrow of their bones. Twas the laughter of unseen children, the whispers of ghostly voices, and the mournful wails that drifted forth from the fireplace that first greeted the Hassets upon their arrival. Footsteps, unbidden and unheard, traced phantom paths through the silent night, while portraits leapt from their perches, defying all reason. And lo, dark apparitions, as insubstantial as shadows in the moonlight, 
danced upon the walls, striking terror into the hearts of those who beheld them. One member of the household even awoke in the dead of night to the sensation of unseen hands, cold and clammy, shaking him from his slumber. And beware the cellar, my friend, for within its depths lies an ancient well, a gateway to realms unknown, where even the bravest soul might find their courage falter. So, dear friend, heed this cautionary tale, for within the walls of the Hasid's home lie secrets that defy explanation and terrors that linger long after the last ember fades from the hearth. Hold tight for the next one. In the annals of Boston's harbor lore, there exists a spectral figure shrouded in the hues of mourning, the Lady in Black. Her tale, spun from the threads of irony and enigma, resonates through the centuries, her demise steeped in the brew of violence and sorrow. It's a narrative that curls like tendrils of fog, intertwining tragedy and the inexplicable. Venture back to the mid-19th century, when Fort Warren stood sentinel upon George's Island, its stone walls echoing with the clangor of confinement and the whispers of despair. Completed in 1850, this bastion of defense served as both a prison and a crucible of strife during the Civil War and beyond. Enter Melanie Lanier, a woman ensnared in the tempest of wartime love and loyalty. Her husband, a Confederate soldier, found himself captive within Fort Warren's stern embrace. Determined to wrench him from captivity, Melanie embarked on a perilous gambit, a clandestine tunnel, a bid for freedom woven with threads of desperation. Yet fate is a fickle spinner and the strands of Melanie's scheme soon unraveled. In the dim confines of the tunnel, tragedy unfurled its wings. A gunshot, a life extinguished in the throes of misguided liberation. Melanie, in a twist of cruel irony, had inadvertently become the agent of her beloved's demise. The courts, blind to the intricacies of love and desperation, pronounced their judgment, death by the hangman's noose. On that somber day of reckoning, Melanie Lanier, clad in the somber raiment of mourning, walked the final steps to the gallows. Her request for a simple black gown granted, she met her end, her spirit tethered to the earth by the weight of her unfulfilled love. Since that fateful day in 1862, whispers abound of the Lady in Black, her ethereal form haunting the ramparts of Fort Warren. She roams the shadowed corridors, her spectral visage a testament to love's enduring legacy and the price paid for its transgressions. Today, Fort Warren stands as a relic of bygone strife, its stones weathered by time and the echoes of history. Open to the curious and the intrepid, it bears witness to the specter of Melanie Lanier, the Lady in Black, forever enshrined in the annals of Boston's haunted past. Hold tight for the next one. Or, perchance you've heard tell of Leeds Beckett University's Headingley campus. It is a sight to behold, nestled amidst the verdant embrace of Beckett's Park, where ancient edifices whisper tales of yore. Since its inception in 1908, this venerable institution has stood witness to the ebb and flow of time, preserving echoes of days long past. Legend has it, dear friend, that spectral entities roam these hallowed halls in the dim recesses of the James Graham building, erstwhile a bastion of healing during the Great War. Eerie murmurs echo through its labyrinthine corridors. Bront Hall, too, harbors its secrets, with whispered breaths lingering in the stillness of its chambers. Even the vacant expanse of Macaulay Hall bears witness to phantom dialogues, heard by none but the unseen. But ah, oh, tis the Grange, eldest among these venerable structures, that holds caught over a realm steeped in phantasmal intrigue. Once a monastic farm in the distant annals of the 1600s, it now stands as a testament to the spectral mysteries that shroud its time-worn visage. Many a soul, both present and erstwhile denizen, have borne witness to peculiar phenomena, unseen eyes that watch, ethereal whispers that dance upon the air, and spectral apparitions that flit through its shadowed halls. Curiosity, as ever the herald of discovery, led a brave band of souls to embark upon a ghostly quest, timed with precision one week ere the night of All Hallows' Eve, guided by the sagacity of Ian Crossland, custodian of spectral law, and the intrepid spirit of Michael Craven, seeker of paranormal truths, they ventured forth in the stillness of the night amidst the ancient stones of the Grange, 
they bore witness to the unexplained spectral clamour that pierced the veil of silence and anomalies detected by Michael's arcane instruments, measuring the very fabric of unseen energies. Thus, dear friend, the veil betwixt the seen and unseen grows ever thinner at Leeds Beckett, where history and mystery intertwine in a dance as old as time itself. Hold tight for the next one. You ever hear the one about that ghost girl haunting Archer Avenue outside Chicago? No? Well, let me tell you about Resurrection Mary. It was back in the dirty 30s when it all started. This young kid named Mary couldn't have been more than 18, 19 years old. She went dancing one night with her fella at the O. Henry Ballroom down in Willow Springs. They had themselves a fierce argument over something, probably something stupid like all young couples fight about. She got riled up and stormed out into the night, face flushed, arms swinging, didn't even take her coat. Poor Mary never made it very far. Some drunk Mick plowed right into her with his automobile. She got thrown into the ditch, and that was it for her. Just a crumpled heap in that little white party dress of hers. They buried her over in Resurrection Cemetery, but her folks didn't have enough scratch to buy a decent gravestone. Just a little flat marker with Mary inscribed. No last name, even. It wasn't long after that when the story started. Fellas driving along Archer would spot a young girl in a white dress trying to thumb a ride. Being gentlemen, they'd pull over and offer her a lift. She always accepted, quiet as a mouse, and gave directions taking them right by the cemetery gates. But as soon as they passed those iron gates, she'd simply vanish into thin air like smoke. Crazy, I know. Sometimes the girl would even show up inside the ballroom among the dancers. The fellas would take her for a pretty little spin around the floor until last call. When it came time to go home, she'd ask one of them to drive her to you guessed at Resurrection Cemetery, vanishing act all over again. Even the Flatfoots got in on the act one night in the 70s. Some guy called them saying he saw a young girl trapped inside the locked cemetery dress and all. When they showed up, the gate was busted open, and there were these tiny handprints on the bars like she was trying to break out. The thing is, nobody's ever actually seen Mary get out of a car and walk into that boneyard. She just disappears. So where does she go? Once is chance, twice is coincidence, but this has been going on for decades now. Me? I've driven that godforsaken road more times than I can count. Never did see nothing out of the ordinary. But I'll tell you this, I keep the windows rolled up tight and don't stop for nobody after dark. Not worth the risk of picking up any hitchhikers, especially that Resurrection Mary girl in her little white dress. Hold tight for the next one. My dear friend, I must regale you with the peculiar tales I have lately uncovered about a certain village in Kent, a place so steeped in otherworldly happenings that it has earned the dread moniker the most haunted village in Britain. Pluckley, as it is called, lies nestled amongst the verdant fields and winding lanes you would rightly expect in that fair county, to gaze upon its thatched cottages, ancient church, and the bucolic river buell flowing gently through. One could scarce imagine the spectral energies said to permeate the very earth, and yet the records boldly declare some 12 to 16 restless spirits are believed to stop those narrow streets and woods. The minds of even the most steadfast locals must surely be occupied by tales of the screaming man, a piteous wraith who fell to his demise at the old brickworks. What agonized cries he must unleash upon the night air to chill the blood. Then there is the highwayman, that dark spectre of old who is said to appear as naught but a menacing shadow in the aptly named Frank Corner, where he was cruelly run through centuries ago. One almost pities the wretch, unable to shed his mortal coil even in death. But let us not neglect the poignant spectre of the elderly watercress woman herself. It is told she was overcome by fire spark from her own pipe one wintry eve as she rested upon Pinnock Bridge. Those few brave souls who have a spider ghost describe a faint rosy glow where her ephemeral form lingers, puffing away into the blackness as she did that fateful night. Spirits clad all in crimson out there tales to tell as well in Pluckley it seems. There roams the Red Lady, whispered to be a member of the noble Daring family, seen flitting through the shadows of St. Nicholas Church. Her white cloaked sister shade treads the hallowed ground too on certain nights, or so it is murmured. Why, I am reminded of the poor tormented schoolmaster who met his own tragic ending by the noose. Despite his grim exhumed, witnesses claim to still make out his form in old coat and stripy trousers, haunting the 
the schoolhouse grounds to this day. The curiosities stretched farther still, my friend. In the 1970s, a party of paranormal investigators was permitted to pass the night within St. Nicholas itself, in hopes of capturing empirical proof of these strange hauntings, though their evening proved eerily uneventful. Upon taking their leave the next morn, the vicar made a passing comment that chilled their very souls, for he claimed to have no knowledge of the dog which had reputedly visited them throughout the night's long, lonely hours. With such a litany of phantasmic accounts, is it any wonder Pluckley has attracted an endless parade of ghost hunters, parapsychologists, and thrill-seekers to its environs? Tours and evening walks dedicated to witnessing these uncanny visions are now regrettably common. I would caution you to steer well clear for your own sake, yet perhaps that is mere foolishness on my part birth of childish superstitions unbefitting a man of science and reason, for what, after all, has modern empiricism to fear from the stuff of mere legends? Hold tight for the next one. You ever hear the stories about old Ben Franklin haunting this city? I'm not talking about his legacy and all that philosophical society nonsense he left behind. I mean his actual ghost wandering these streets. They say he lurks around Independence Hall, where those crazy revolutionaries first started yapping about breaking from the crown. Can't really blame his spirit for hanging around there after playing such a major role. Then there's the tales of him nodding off at City Hall or drifting through the church graveyard where they buried him. I'll give the old man credit that simple gravestone is classic Franklin humility. But the kookiest stories come from over at the Philosophical Society's library. Way back in 1884, some librarian got knocked aside by Franklin's ghost, headed straight for the shelves like he was itching to dig into a new book. Even crazier are the reports of that big statue of him, the one out front in that damn toga get-up he was so fond of. Folks claim they've seen it straight up abandon its plinth and go dancing merrily down the street, like the statue has better places to be than keeping watch over Franklin's old book club. They'll tell you it moseys across town to Franklin's colonial digs or cuts loose at the local pubs just like when he was in the flesh. Can you picture it? That marble version of old Ben doing a little jig in the road, heading off to throw a few back at the city tavern? Now I tend to doubt stories like that. But sometimes late at night when that statue is just a silhouette in the darkness, you could almost fool yourself into thinking its feet started shuffling. Knowing Franklin and his puckish sense of humor though, he's probably just enjoying the final laugh from beyond the grave. Either way, the man who played such an outsized role in shaping this city. You can't walk two blocks without seeing his fingerprints everywhere you look. The restaurants, companies, museums, it's all Franklin's Philadelphia when you get down to it. His spirit is still keeping a weather eye on this place, whether you believe in ghosts or not. Hold tight for the next one. My dear friend, I must relate to you an account so peculiar so fraught with intimations of the spectral realm that I can scarce believe the evidence of my own eyes and ears. You are no doubt familiar with the stately edifice of Blickling Hall in Norfolk, a grand estate which can trace its provenance back through the inky pools of centuries past. Yet few, I venture, are aware that this handsome example of Jacobean architecture, with its magnificently tended grounds and lush gardens most beguiling to the eye, harbors darksome secrets within its very walls. For you see, Blickling Hall has previously borne the infamous distinction of being deemed the most haunted dwelling in the whole of Britain. The root of these supernatural afflictions, by all accounts, can be traced to that most tragic of figures who once made her home upon these very grounds, the ill-fated Anne Boleyn herself. You will recall how this raven-tressed beauty, after failing to present her lord and husband Henry VIII with the male heir he so desperately craved, was recklessly accused of deceptions and debaucheries most foul. Her lovely head was promptly severed from its slender neck by the unmerciful bite of the executioner's blade on the 19th of May, 1536. And it is on each solemn anniversary of that dread immolation, the servants declare in hushed tones that Her Majesty's restless spirit manifests anew at Blickling Hall. A shrouded apparition swathed all in purest white, her severed neck exposed for all to behold. She is said to arrive in a funereal spectral carriage drawn by invisible horses. 
The spectre then glides up the hall's very steps to drift aimlessly throughout the premises till ruddy dawn scatters the shadows once more. But Anne's is not the only spectre said to haunt these corridors, my friend. For the former master of the estate, Sir Henry Hobart, having passed from this vale of tears in the 17th century from wounds sustained in a dastardly duel, is rumoured to linger on in grotesque unrest as well. One courageous groundskeeper confided to me that his faithful hound, a mastiff of stalwart pedigree, would ever refuse to set paw within the very bedchamber where the unfortunate baronet was laid to expire. The noble beast would instead plant himself at the threshold, hackles raised in warning, as if warding away some unseen terror. I myself, on the occasion of my last sojourn to these hallowed grounds, fancied that I espied a deathly pallor hovering in the shadows of the library annex. Though I turned my gaze away but briefly, when I chanced to look again, the spectre had dissolved as softly as the tendrils of morning mist. So you see, my dear fellow, Glickling Hall clearly remains a retreat for the unquiet dead as well as the living. Should you chance to pay a visit there yourself, I urge you to steady your nerves against whatever eldritch frights may present themselves. For no matter what assurances the administrators may offer, that ancient place of majesty and dread is manifestly also a haunted one. Abandon all sense of skepticism, all ye who enter here. Hold tight for the next one. You ever hear about the Pierce Place over in Massachusetts? Big old Victorian mansion out in the woods near Gardner. Place has quite the haunted reputation around those parts. It all started back when the original owner, Sylvester Pierce, had the 7,000 square foot home built for himself, his wife Susan, and their kid. Man had made his money in the furniture trade and wanted to live large. Hosted all kinds of high society types there Calvin Coolidge, Bette Davis, P. Tithis Barnum, and even Norman Rockwell, you name it. Real swanky operation. Except within a week of moving in, Susan up and died. Some mystery illness they couldn't put a finger on. So much for their dream house. Pierce didn't stay a widower long though. Not even a year before he took a new bride. Some young thing named Ellen, 30 years his junior. They had a couple more kids together before kicking the bucket themselves years later. That's when the real trouble started. Pierce's two surviving sons started fighting like hell over the property and the furniture business. Jealousy, greed, you know the drill. Then the depression hit and that big house fell into disrepair when the company went under. The youngest boy, Eddie, tried running it as a boarding house for a while but the place just kept soaking up more misery. Lots of sudden deaths in those years, a few murky at best. The haunts started piling up soon after. Every damn ghost story you can imagine has been tied to that place by now. Folks talking about seeing apparitions, hearing voices, objects flying off shelves, feelings of getting shoved around. Some even claimed to hear the sound of a lion's roar rattling the whole damn house at night. Rumor is, it's old man Pierce himself making all that ruckus from beyond the grave. As if he still pissed off his beautiful mansion brought so much heartache instead of the pride and comfort he built it for. You can't really blame him though, can you? Modern owners haven't fared much better either. I knew one poor Wahoo Lillian who moved in with her husband without knowing the place's history. It didn't take long before the paranormal pisser started hitting the fan every which way. Hearing chants on the walls, seeing ghosts beckon her down halls, that whole fun bit. When some ghost hunter bunch asked the spirits who was running the show there, they straight up said, Lillian, clear as day. Can't get more blatant a warning than that to cut and run, if you ask me. Problem is, the Pierce place has turned into such a legendary haunt that folks just keep on going for the thrill of maybe catching a glimpse of something otherworldly bound to stir up old Sylvester's ire even more having his private spirits put on exhibition like that after all these years. Mark my words, someone's going to catch the brunt of that old man's anger sooner rather than later if they ain't careful. Thanks for joining us on this eerie adventure. If you enjoyed the chills, don't forget to subscribe. More mysteries await. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay curious.